National Cybersecurity Center, a role that he had uh, till autumn last year. He is now a professor of practice in the management of public organizations at the Blavatnik School of Government in the UK. Again, Mr. Martin, uh, welcome and we'll come back to you in a minute. We are also joined by two prominent panelists, well known at least in the Swedish cybersecurity uh, community. It is uh, Ms. Anne-Marie Eklund uh, Levinder, who is uh, Chief Information Security Officer at the Swedish Internet Foundation, among many other things. And the second panelist is Mr. Johan Victorin, a consultant at Intel Group, and again, among, among many other things. And we look forward to listening to your questions and comments later, and again, welcome. Uh, but now, without uh, further ado, I will hand over the floor to Mr. Martin, who will share with us uh, his view on uh, challenges, uh, lessons learned from the UK Cyber Center. So, uh, Kieran, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gunnar. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, I hope you can see and hear me. Um, okay, uh, very privileged that you asked me to join. I'm aware there are more significant global events happening right now than my reflections on the UK cybersecurity. So if you're, you must be really um, passionate and dedicated, as I know Anne-Marie and Johan are, about um, public policy and public organisations and cybersecurity if you're skipping the um, presidential inauguration. Um, my, uh, my wife is American, so my two children are half American. Uh, so hopefully this means that their uh, fixation with events in Washington means that um, the chances of small children interrupting, as we've all become used to over the last year, is um, uh, is, uh, is 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 receding. Um, another real um, a reason why it's a real pleasure, um, and thank you uh, for doing this in English. Given that when I look around, I think I'm the only uh, um, uh, native um, uh, speaker. Um, it is a pleasure to do this because in my six and a half years running UK cybersecurity, I couldn't have asked for a better set of um, public and private sector partners than um, uh, than those I found in Sweden. Um, I often think when we talk of Brexit and so forth and impacts on uh, various aspects of UK national life. I think cybersecurity, and I make this as a neutral observation rather than as a political point, um, the things that we were able to do together are relatively um, unimpacted by the competence of the EU. Um, and a lot of the cybersecurity cooperation that I was able to do within the continent of Europe was voluntarily bilateral or voluntarily multilateral, and Sweden played a huge role in, in that. And of course, particularly with Ericsson and telecoms, you know, the, the um, technical expert and commercial expertise of Sweden and technology has always been uh, something that um, <clears throat> the UK has, um, has, has really valued. So very encouraged by the momentum of the conversation in Sweden about um, cyber security and very pleased in a small way, if I can do anything in the next 20 minutes or so, uh, to give you some food for thought um, and then take questions alongside the distinguished panel. Um, I'm very happy to do so. Um, the one thing I'll say about the UK's experience, and you've asked me to talk about the UK's experience, so I, I, I won't uh, apologise for being Anglo-centric uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, the one thing I will say, to be slightly challenging, is that uh, one of the least important things, it was not unimportant, but one of the uh, one of the things that we did that is well known in cybersecurity circles, but is of lesser importance than some other things, is set up a national cybersecurity centre. Because at the end of the day, that is what in the UK we call technically a machinery of government change. And we do machinery of government changes all the time, and some of them work and some of them don't. And um, the reason I say that is that, you know, the vision, and there was a bunch of us, and we were lucky because political and budgetary stars aligned at the same time, but a bunch of us had a vision, and the vision wasn't just let's have a big centre. Uh, the vision was actually much more fundamental than that. It was let's change our approach to cybersecurity. Let's change the way this nation thinks about a secure digital environment. And I will I'll tell a story as to one of the ways in which I came around to that way of thinking personally. Um, 
Uh, I was appointed at the end of 2013 to be head of UK cybersecurity, but it was back then just um, <clears throat> um, you know a little bit of GCHQ, largely operating in in secret, no public um, profile, no real overt engagement with uh, industry, no incident management function to reassure the public when things went wrong and anything like that. So it was actually quite a nice gig um, in terms of you could hide, and it was a prestigious job, but nobody expected a great deal of it and not least because we've been chucking money at cybersecurity for quite a few years and hadn't really achieved um, um, uh, uh, all that much we started um so the ncsc didn't come into being until 2016 so that period from the end of 2013 until a decision to establish a center was taken in 2015 alongside crucially a new strategy and um, is quite an important one and in the course of around um, 2014, 2015, I attended, you know, one of these, one of the many cybersecurity conferences that take place. It was back in the pre-pandemic days, so I made the trip and it was to Georgetown University in Washington. And there was a dinner um, at the end of it and the guest speaker was a man called Art Cobiello. Now, if you don't know who he is, and most people won't, uh, he founded a very well-known cybersecurity company in San Francisco called RSA. And he had just stepped down and he was in highly reflective mode about um, uh, about um, his experience. But he said some very interesting things about public policy. And he went through expertly, almost in forensic detail, insofar as you can do forensic detail in an after dinner speech, he went through the US's public policy experience of cybersecurity in, the two, in, in this century. And he went through two strategies under President George W. Bush and two strategies under President Obama. And he was really meticulously, and he said, so the essence of the 2003 strategy was information sharing and public-private partnerships. And then the 2005 strategy, information sharing, public-private partnerships. Obama comes in, huge fanfare about cybersecurity. He was the digitally savvy president who'd known how to use social media in campaigning. Information sharing and public-private partnerships. And then another Obama strategy, information sharing, public-private partnerships. And I thought this is really exciting because when I'd come in as a novice to cybersecurity, the received wisdom in Britain was you really need to get private sector information sharing going and you need to establish public-private partnerships. And I went, well, okay, that's great. How, you know, And I was beginning to wonder at that point, well, what does this actually mean? Because I've been in post for about a year and was really struggling to put detail on it. And so this was a bit of a sort of, you know, apple falling from the tree moment for me because I thought, well, OK, so the US has been talking the same thing, spouting the same slogans for, you know, a decade and hasn't actually achieved very much. To my surprise, I shouldn't really say this, um, uh, Mr. Coviello then went on and said, so what we need to do is do, do it properly, do information sharing and uh, public-private partnerships properly. My own conclusion, which I am vain enough to think was a better one, um, was that actually, if you've tried the same thing in the American experience four times in 10 years, and if you've tried the same thing in Britain, although we haven't done as many strategies, but we've done two, and they both said that, uh, twice in five years. And so if the US and the UK between them had tried the same thing six times in, in a decade, it was probably not the right thing and you needed to do other things. And so I remember coming back and gathering a strategy team together of people I respected who were way more technical than me, but also they had a blend of experience. And I think this is important. They weren't just technologists. There were some people who understood the economics of technology and so forth. And I said, look, this strategy of ours, um, is there any actual substance to it? It seems a bit passive. We organize conferences, we have committees of government and industry. We set up these information exchanges, but nobody seems to put any useful information into them and, and all the rest of it. And a lot of them said, oh, God, thank goodness somebody's actually said this. You know, we, um, we have a really passive strategy. There are massively fundamental problems in um, the way technology works and government just sort of sits there and says yeah well you know we'll do some elite national security work that's all a bit secret um, and then we will encourage you know the market to um, to sort everything um, out and it, it doesn't really work like that. I said well what do you mean? He said well and, and here's one example sort of a hold that thought example. I said um, uh, brand spoofing Okay, um, so in other words, taking a brand, um, whether it's Tesco supermarkets, Ikea or whatever, and just sending lots of emails, pretending to be from them and then clicking on links. I said, uh, okay, well, what's the problem there? I said, well, you know, Tesco and Ikea will all spend lots, large amounts of money on their own systems and network security, but they won't spend any money fixing that. I said, well, why not? Because consumers do not punish um, uh, retailers for being faked. 
you know, you know, why, you know, if if you like Tes if you like food shopping in Tesco, even if you get a fake email from somebody pretending to be Tesco, you're not going to punish Tesco for that. So there's no commercial reason for Tesco to do this. This ends up as a massive scale fraud because it's um, and a huge sort of digital poison in the digital environment, digital pollutant, and nobody has got a commercial incentive to do anything about it. So what do you do about things like that? Information sharing isn't going to sort it out, nor is a public-private partnership, because unless you, you know, actually either make it easy for the company to do something about it or give them some incentives um, or, re or regulate them, you know, they're not going to have any reason to do it. So we started thinking through all of this. Um, now, at the same time, to be fair, there were other um, people who weren't sort of just re-strategizing, but there were a lot of people saying, so... Um, um, uh, two other things helped us um, uh, when we were pitching this more activist um, strategy. Uh, one was um, we had a couple of we had some incidents. So there was quite a serious incident with a company called Talk Talk. It's our fourth largest telecoms company, and it suffered what it was claimed was what they claimed was a sophisticated and serious uh, cyber attack. It was actually, and I'm not making this up, a 15-year-old using a 17-year-old exploit. Um, but um, that incident ran out of control because, you know, as we've seen, for example, as we've all seen during pandemics, you know, although there are different models in different countries, there is a public official, you know, in this case, a distinguished medical professor, um, in the case of terrorism, a police chief uh, or an intelligence chief, in the case of floods, a chief environment officer, whatever, who stands in front of the camera and says, right, dear country, well, Britain or Sweden, whatever, dear country, this is the problem. Here's who's at risk. Here's your what risk of. Here's what you're not at risk of, so don't panic. Here's the things you need to do to protect yourselves and so forth. And nobody was doing that in cybersecurity. So the talk talk situation got out of control, even though it was actually quite an insignificant little attack. There was large scale public panic and people were emptying their bank accounts because they thought they were gonna be robbed and all that sort of um, uh, stuff. So that was another reason. And then uh, a final reason was um, you know, some more responsible sector leaders, particularly those in banking, were trying to establish a framework for more resilient uh, cybersecurity. And they said to the government, um, who do we talk to about this? And the government gave them a three page letter saying, you know, well, for this, you need to talk to that agency. For that, you need to talk to this agency. And a lot of them, including the then governor of the Bank of England, Governor Mark Carney, said that this wasn't a terribly satisfactory situation. So all these factors align to put momentum to reform the way government did um, cybersecurity to form a single centre. But the most important thing by far was we were going to change strategy. And we decided that actually, you know, one of the reasons cybersecurity is such a hard problem for open, free, democratic, high-tech societies um, is that ordinary market forces in some parts of it, like, you know, threat detection, where, you know, Symantec and all sorts of really good companies are really um, um, uh, good at doing this and in-house companies, uh, companies like Ericsson have good in-house capabilities, and um, that there were fundamental problems that the market um, uh, didn't fix, and fundamental pub, you know, digital public health issues that actually the government needed to pay uh, attention to. Um, it also helped that, you know, cybersecurity was becoming a sort of, you know, significant political issue, so politicians like to be associated with it, but um, I, I won't dwell on that. So you had all these factors coming together, but the one thing, sorry to sort of completely labour the point, but the one thing was there was a fundamental change of strategy as well as the fundamental um, organisation. If, you know, I'm inferring from the fact you've asked me to speak, you know, if you think there are some positive lessons to be drawn, um, from the establishment of a national cybersecurity centre for the UK. Um, the um, in insofar as we've had any success, um, the primary reason is the change of strategy, not the change of government of of, of organisational structures. So the NCC was then, in my view, set up to do four things. We did this classic, um, we did this classic sort of, you know, bureaucratic paper where we talked about, you know, uh, jargon things like we were going to, uh, we had objectives like understand and nurture and all this sort of stuff, uh, respond, you know, buzzwords. Um, I actually sort of didn't find those terribly useful. Um, I don't really think like that. We, the, the NCC ended up doing four fundamental things, in my view. So these were the four sort of changes of functions. Number one was it gripped incidents, it gripped incidents and threats as hard as it could, you know, just tried to smother the country with sort of uh, reassurance. So, you know, just instead of being passive, you just absolutely jumped on incidents. 
Um, and that's not just, you know, about going to the media um, and, you know, doing that public, digital public health function, you know, the epidemiologist function of saying, this is the problem, this is what you do. It was also about just studying them, making sure you had the capabilities to detect accurately. So if you contrast the talk talk attack in 2015, where it took us a while to work out that no, it wasn't a terribly sophisticated attack. And then the government more or less absented itself from the um, process of um, uh, reassuring the public. Contrast that two years later, um, you know, the, the so-called WannaCry attack um, was, you know, it's faded a bit from memory um, and didn't do as much harm as it could have. You know, at the time, all of the following things were true. It was the middle of a general election campaign. So pretty heightened moment of set political sensitivity. It was on the National Health Service, which is, you know, as um, some observers have said of, of the UK, you know, now that we're in the post-Christian age, it's the closest thing the UK has to a national religion. Um, and it was very, very hard to work out what was going on. So this was a big deal. And, the, and it was about six months after the NCC was set up. And you know, the, the NCC was able to grip that incident to the extent that the two things happened. One was saturation media, you know, in terms of and guidance and issuing of guidance. So, you know, within 24 hours, there was a guidance document for the general public, a guidance document for business leaders and a guidance document for technical people who worked in companies. All three of those uh, were out within 24 hours. And, you know, people were on the TV saying, look at these, you know, down, down, download this. But also there was some high end intelligence detection work. Um, which meant that something that looked like it was transnational criminality was actually the North Koreans making a mistake. That was really hard work and it's important to know that because obviously when you're looking to you know, prevent the next attack, you need to know um, uh, what, uh, who, it was in the, um, uh, uh, who it was in the first place. And that's why actually, you know, and I think there is a lesson here organizationally, um, when you set up a national center like ours, do think about its relationship with the rest of the security state. Um, what the NCSC model was trying to do was do a good hybrid between two extremes that don't work. So extreme one is it's in you know the so-called deep state. It's very secret. Um, that gives you great capabilities and great awareness. The problem is you can't do anything with it because it's all secret. So you can't tell businesses because your sources, you think your sources are too secret. You can't reassure the public, etc., etc. So that's one problem. The problem at the other end is you do something completely open and you know a sort of citizens' advice bureau, as we call them in the UK for digital. The problem is it's a government agency that adds nothing to what the private sector already provides because it doesn't have access to any information that the private sector doesn't. The National Cyber Security Centre is a sort of hybrid where you can wash through some of the classified data with less classified data to disguise it and you can push information out there. So that whole, you know, grip the threat and grip the incidents that it causes is the first uh, thing. The second bucket of activity is was actually what you might call national level risk management. Um, you know, um, when I started in the British Civil Service in 1997, any leak of any document, you know, people leaving a really boring, um, uh, inconsequential paper about environmental regulations was still a security breach. Um, in this age, that you know mindset of you know you're going to lose data, you're going to lose some information. It's just not possible to try to defend everything. Um, and also, you know, if you look at digital services for government, um, uh, full security will make you know um, get, getting them to a particular level of security, even for some things like payment systems, will render them unusable. Um, so how you know? Um, Ultra security um, is very expensive and very clunky. So what do you need it for? So for a body like AFSI, there's plenty of things that you will need to spend a lot of money um, using high grade uh, security for. Um, and the NCSC model went all the way through from having a specialist team that spent a fortune or you know, supported the Ministry of Defence and spending a fortune on securing defence assets all the way through to um, teams that provided advice for small charitable organizations on how to do the basics well, given how much money they had. I think the problem was in the past, we used to give guidance to everybody that implied you needed nation state level defenses, which A, most people don't need, and B, even if they do need them, they can't afford them. So you need to, you know, you need to calibrate, um, you need to calibrate risk. And also for a national center, you then need to, because you know, very often these capabilities aren't there in mainstream um, uh, departments or agencies, you need to give them specialist help. So in my view, and this isn't public, um, so please sort of protect it, but the NCC I think has got about the capacity to do 10 specialist bits of advice at any one time. 
to what, what we, and I, I mean by that, not just generic bits of guidance, but actually embed somebody in the project team for smart meters. You're building a smart meter system, you know, and this was one of the first ones the NCSC did, and they published the way that they did it so that um, you could uh, work it out um, so, so that people could have confidence in it. You know, um, how, if you're building a smart meter system which involves putting an internet connected box in every home and business in the country, um, you can't protect them all. So how do you design it in such a way that, you know, the Russians, if it's the Russians, have to do something really high quality, really obvious to do national level um, at harm so that you deter them from doing that. And effectively, they won't do it outside of an act of war. So, you know, the philosophy behind the smart meters protection is if they really want to get my smart meter and out there, you can. If you want to take out my village, you probably can quite easily. If you want to take out the whole of my county, that's going to be really, really quite hard. You're going to have to work really hard, and it's going to be obvious that you're targeting the UK. So you're building in that sort of resilience. The same approach is now happening to things like um, the new interbank payment system. Uh, and one of the things that's very interesting in President-elect, uh, well, it was, sorry, he said President-elect for another six minutes, uh, in President-elect Biden's $10 billion cybersecurity program for the federal government, which I think is a really smart idea. I wish the UK would would uh, copy it and um, is a huge funding boost to get off legacy IT systems for critical services um, because you know that's the moment of opportunity legacy systems risk in legacy systems cannot be transformed it can only be mitigated you can just you know so if you're left if you've got clunky old systems you can only mitigate them uh, you can only sort of manage the risk as far as you can you can't um, just completely change um, the, the risk profile but when you do something new you can build in that resilience from the start it's expensive it can be expensive um, but you should choose it so those are that those are the first two things so sort of incidents and detections followed by a national level risk management working out what you care about most the third and fourth bucket, and then I'll bring it to a close, are, are a bit more interesting and novel, or at least where back then, you know, I'm conscious that quite a lot of time has um, um, has uh, elapsed since we started out on this. So the, the third one is what you might call fixing some of the structural problems in the internet. So this comes back to, for example, that anti-spoofing device, um, that anti-spoofing stuff uh, in Tesco, is the, the Tesco problem. So you look at some things and you don't have to have a grand strategy about this. You just need to find some things that might work, at least as at least at the start, and then try and scale them up a bit. So you look at how does it work that um, you know, you've got this huge problem of um, fake identities floating around the internet and nobody's incentivized to take care of them. Um, so we did a pilot, not with a private sector company because it was too hard. We did it with a part of government. So because the NCSE remained part of an intelligence agency, but a public facing part of the intelligence agency, it was a novel construct. Um, we had access to loads of data, so we could analyze who in the UK was getting spoofed the most. And by our estimation, by a long way, the most spoofed brand in the UK was a government brand. It was Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, the tax authority. Um, loads, because a very good way, and we saw this during the pandemic with lots of government support schemes, a very good way of baiting people into clicking on dodgy links is to pretend you're giving them money. And so, you know, saying your HMRC, saying we've miscalculated your tax, click here to claim is a very good way of luring people uh, to do it. Uh, there's something called the DMARC protocol, Domain Name Authentication uh, Protocol. Uh, we adapted it, we published it in open source, we piloted it with HMRC, and for, I can see some nods, but for those who don't know what it is, it's essentially a way of telling internet distribution channels, uh, this is what a genuine email from HMRC should look like. Uh, if it doesn't look like this, don't um, deliver it. Um, and actually, we wrote something and said, deliver it to us so we can analyze it. Uh, in the first year of that um, pilot in 2017, we collected 500 million emails uh, pretending to be HMRC, um, which shows, I think, the scale, but also the clever part of that wasn't just 500 million things that um, attacks that were stopped or you know, spoofs that were uh, stopped. It was actually 500 million times where you know, presumably British citizen didn't have to hover over a link and work out, you know, is that is that our genuine email? Because it didn't get delivered. So there were all the things that we did. Um, so, for example, um, we, we find that when there was a maliciously hosted website, if we um, uh, asked somebody to take it down, they tended to take it down um, because they didn't know it was malicious. Someone had altered it. Um, but we couldn't do that at scale. So uh, we paid a small company to automate um, the request in a way that we could provide the, the technical evidence that showed it was malicious. And so they did do this at really um, high speed. And that did two things. One was it reduced the average time a dodgy website was up in the UK from just over a day to less than an hour. 
um, and it reduced the UK share of um, um, fishing sites from about 5% of global traffic to about 2% in, in a few years. So there are things like that that government can do where the market doesn't work. Um, and there are other things as well, but in the interest of time. And then uh, I, I won't go into them. And then the final thing, and this was about, you know, so much of cybersecurity from government is about communication, but also about enabling and empowering, was um, we tried as hard as we could to change the narrative of people and risk. So um, one of my big um, um, passionate feelings about cybersecurity is that we make it too hard for people to use technology safely. There's a sort of producer capture passwords is the classic where I own a network you want to use and so I'm going to make it safe for me. So I'm going to make it hard for you to join my network by giving you a complex password requirement. Um, but you have to do 25 of these in an average week and they're all supposed to be separate and a, a behavioral scientist computed for us so that was the equivalent of asking people if you if you followed government best practice on password policy you were being asked to um, uh, remember a new 600 digit number every month that was the that was the mental equivalent of what you're being asked to do so we changed it recommended password managers recommended um, you know, three strong words that were memorable to you but not guessable by anybody else etc etc we um, you know, went around saying, don't say things like people are the weakest link because they're not. Technology is a human creation for uh, human beings. And also we encourage businesses, published you know, toolkits for businesses to say, this is how you think about risk. Um, here are five questions that any competent chief executive should be able to talk to a chief information security officer. Here is how to interpret an ethical phishing test. Those tests where you, you know, spray your own staff with fake emails to see if they click on the link. Um, uh, in year one, you say we got a click rate of 30%, in year two, you have a click rate of 10%. Isn't that a great improvement? Well, it depends, because if the 10% includes your systems administrator, I'd rather have the 30% that didn't, because if the 10% includes the systems administrator, the attacker owns you. Whereas if it's 30% of you know general sales staff who have access to a limited database, then you know it's it's not the case. Any competent executive should be able to understand that risk balance. So we did four things that were quite different, incidents um, and detection, um, national level risk, um, fixing some of the structural problems of the internet and trying to make the internet easier and technology easier for people to use um, uh, to use uh, safely. Underpinning all of that, and I think this is important, is um, a sort of transformative approach to communications. You just, you couldn't publish enough at the technical level, you know, what do you think of um, quantum resistant cryptography um, in the future as a future challenge? Well, put it out there, get it scrutinized. I mean, there are bits of it that are secret and you can't do that and you'll have to engage with it. But most of the time, I mean, you cannot keep what's going to be a multi-trillion dollar industry. Um, you cannot keep um, uh, 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 that, uh, that secret. And then actually, you know, when we did research, it was like, you know, seriously, I've just bought my 11 year old a phone for the first time. Just tell me what I need to do, <laughs> make it really easy and, and so forth. You know, that end to end um, uh, um, um, security. The organizational part, just to, to, to bring this to an end and, and get to questions, the organizational part is important. I think there is a delicate balance. You know, people talk about cybersecurity as a team sport. Britain, in my view, when I started, was a bit too teamy. Everybody had a stake, but nobody was in charge. Um, there was a point, you know, particularly in major incidents, uh, where you know, um, having that um, um, uh, uh, single point of accountability um, helped. Uh, I do remember post WannaCry, there was a wonderful moment, um, which I shouldn't really tell you, but but it's I, I will anyway. Um, we were doing the sort of post crisis evaluation of how we performed, and there were various complaints from parts of government saying it wasn't as collaborative as uh, we uh, as we were used to in previous um, uh, incidents, and that was obviously a criticism of us. And to be fair, the National Security Advisor who was chairing the meeting read out the bit of the government's strategy that said the National Cybersecurity Centre shall be in charge of leading the response. Um, to all incidents so you know we we're being criticized for doing exactly what we were supposed to do and you have to take quick decisions and you have to be responsible for them I think it does help when you're um, so that's the crisis part of it on the building resilience part of it I think it does help an industry for example the banks and the telecoms industry love having a single conversation you know um, and in particular then because they can say that doesn't work for our industry and we say okay that's fine and you know you blend it into something that works for their uh, industry but you don't have to run into all sorts of different um, uh, uh, people. Um, 
uh, having said all that, you know, I do think that when, for example, American friends say to me, we need to set up an NCSC, I have two responses. One is, it doesn't, you know, as I said earlier, it doesn't work unless you have a, unless you, what's it for? You know, what strategic change do you want it to uh, um, bring about? And secondly, the cost of changing government differs from country to country. So in the US, when you set up a new Department of State, you need acts of Congress. If you remember, for those of you who remember the struggle to set up the Department of Homeland Security, it took forever, huge battles in Congress adding on bits of irrelevant law and so on, because that's the way the US system works. So one of the reasons why the US and Romy will never copy the UK is that it's just too disruptive. And that's a legitimate choice, you know, disruption matters. In the UK, I remember in 2008, when I was working in the central uh, department, uh, Prime Minister Gordon Brown wanted to set up a new department of climate change. And what this involved was publishing a press release that there was going to be a department of climate change. And the new Secretary of State, who became leader of the Labour Party subsequently, called Ed Miliband, was about to go there. And one of the things I had to do was I printed out a A4 word page, a Microsoft word page saying Department of Climate Change, put the Crown logo on it, printed it out, took it across. A gentleman from the outgoing department um, took the screws off a plaque a cover <laughs> on the outside of the building. We put the, my, my little A4 page, Department of Climate Change, screwed it back in protocol happened and the Department of, of, Climate, of Energy and Climate Change came into existence just like that. That's how easy machinery of government changes and how undisruptive they are in, um, in, 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 in the UK. So it differs and the cost of disruption um, um, uh, uh, does um, uh, matter. My final point to conclude, to sort of try and lift us back up again from screwdrivers and um, in departments, is about what this is now about. You know, you can. Um, I wouldn't be. Um, you know, I wouldn't be downbeat about. Oh, it's taking Sweden too long to come across. It's the moment. To, the moment to focus on secure and safer technology is now. My view on technology is that you know, and the prioritization of cybersecurity. I would say this, wouldn't I? You know, there are two ways of looking at it. As we come out of the pandemic, one is um, you know, look. We've got a health crisis and we're all broke. Um, we just, and you know, political bandwidth is now just not there anymore, so we can't do this. And that's understandable. And to some extent, it will, it, it, it will happen in, in all of our countries. The, but another way of looking at it, which I think is more strategically smart, is think of 2020 where technology failed. Actually, technology had a really good 2020. Nobody expected um, uh, the pandemic to happen in the way that it did. Um, huge increases in demand for technology, um, which the industry met by and large, and it kept us professionally going to some extent, and personally going because it kept us in touch with loved ones in a way that we couldn't have done in the 1980s, for example. So technology had a very good 2020, and we managed this huge change to online working, unplanned and very sudden, the opposite of good risk management, you know, 5% of people work from home and by oh, tomorrow that's going to be 95% or 100%. But we did it quite safely. What that tells me though is that public confidence in technology, maintaining and hopefully enhancing it is now an absolutely imperative public policy goal. We just cannot afford to have um, our, our citizens lose confidence in technology. So the pursuit of safer technology through sound public policy and sound public organisations should now be a top priority. And that's the pursuit, however you choose to organise government, that's a strategic goal that I think all of us in our free, open societies should be thinking about. And with that, I will hand over and I hope I haven't taken up too much time. Thank you very much indeed, Kieran, for a presentation that in my view was both specific, candid and thought provoking. And we will now see what thoughts you have provoked with, with the panellists. Starting with inviting first Johan and then Anne-Marie to, to ask uh, one question each. And I suggest that we take both questions and you can then sort of bundle them together into one response. So, uh, Johan, first uh, on with your question. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I'm going back for the information exchange uh, between the public and private sector. How did you arrange this for incident reporting and response technically, personally, and how did you clear law obstacles such as Freedom of Information Act and political duels such as competitional rules? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Johan and uh, Anne-Marie, your question, please. 
Yes, I just want to unmute myself, it's much easier. Uh, as a member of the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency, the Cybersecurity Advisory Board, I visited the UK Cybersecurity Centre in 2012, and we were quite impressed of what you were doing. Uh, and I find myself uh, remembering a lot of things in what you are telling us. Uh, thank you, by the way, for a very, very good uh, presentation. Uh, the government is no longer a monopolist, but they have more and more dependencies of the private sector. And to be honest, right now, the government agencies in Sweden involved to shape the center, the national center, is only half-hearted interested in talking to the private sector. That is in my opinion. Uh, so what, in your opinion, is the most obvious uh, benefits in, in the, encouraging the pub, private sector to take part in this and what is the obvious pitfalls not doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran. Back to you. Well, thanks for two very good um, questions. <clears throat> I think on the sort of barriers um, on Johan's questions, it was quite um, um, on things like freedom of information and competition rules. Um, I think um, there was a certain amount of cleverness and a certain amount of luck. Um, so in terms of um, uh, things like freedom of information and so forth, um, I think um, being part of an intelligence agency, um, we were exempt from freedom of information. I think as we got more and more public, I often wondered how sustainable that was, but nobody really um, seemed to mind, not least because we were quite sort of voluntarily uh, 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 transparent and sort of tricky things like um, sensitive um, um, uh, you know sensitive casework would probably have been covered by regulatory exemptions anyway um, however your competition point's quite interesting um, in, in uh, 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 um, because I think we always worried about um, you know being seen to favor um, uh, uh, companies and so forth. Um, I think, um, you know, and we always worried about people legally reviewing our um, <clears throat> um, uh, criteria for, you know, specifically helping <clears throat> um, companies for uh, free. But I think, um, you know, we, um, again, there was a lot of goodwill. From the, I think a lot of it was goodwill from the private sector. You know, the private sector um, leadership sort of more or less said that whilst they couldn't obviously vouch for every uh, single company, that, you know, the underlying culture they're trying to promote was it was as if there was a government agency ready to make sensible judgments on, you know, what the most important cases were, uh, then no one was going to sue them for not, you know, uh, for, 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 for not sort of helping them. Where we got really lucky um, was, you know, throughout my experience in government, the number of times where I've seen, you know, decision takers say, right, um, uh, uh, we understand um, the, the we, we, we understand that what you're doing is risky, but uh, we will back you, and when things go wrong, uh, we will um, uh, you know we will stand by you, and then they don't. <laughs> so you know, um, so you, you, you let's say um, data aggregation is your classic. You know, you say right, we need to do more data sharing to enhance public services, and there's some massive data breach, and um, you know even though the people running that public service say, but we warned you that there might be this sort of data breach. Oh, this is terrible, and so forth. Well, I. I was always worried about was um, publishing and um, uh, sensitive information. So as I said in the presentation, we took this thing, we needed to be more transparent. David Cameron, when he was Prime Minister, very interestingly, used to accuse us of being the best students of cybersecurity. We'd come and brief him and say, look at this, this is, look what we've discovered, the Russians, the Iranians doing whatever, and he'd go, yeah, and what we're going to do about it? Well, what do you mean? I mean, it's all classified. We can't do anything with it. Well, what use is that? And don't come telling me how clever you are by giving me a problem. My worry there was always that we might end up publishing some data that we shouldn't have. And I was very explicit with political decision takers that at that point they would have to back us because that was the whole model and I was priced in. Luckily, and I've gone there and it still, as far as I know, hasn't happened, but that was, that was yet to happen. Um, I think on Marie's points about sort of incentivizing and encouraging um, um, the private sector, this is where again, that sort of goodwill um, 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 came in. Uh, I don't know, I mean, I can't speak for the Swedish um, uh, attitude, corporate attitude and all of this, but put it this way, you know, I mean, in the country of Margaret Thatcher, you know, business was often happily to, happy to tell the government to get out of the way or to complain that the government was encroaching too much. This was not one of those areas, you know, and um, I think also we set it up not as, I mean, you know, there are, 
all of these reforms have taken place under you know conservative centre-right governments. They've always been loath to regulate, and there've been disadvantages to that. Um, but there have also been advantages because the culture was explicitly enabling. We are setting up this government agency. It's got expertise, but it's there to help you. It's not there to regulate or punish you. Um, uh, and I think that helped incentivize um, them. Um, so it was interesting, for example, when the GDPR regulation came in. Um, Previously, informal relationships became more formalized at the input request of the companies and general counsel started appearing more meetings than they used to, uh, which I found quite an interesting sort of cautionary tale and all of that, even though I think the GDPR by and large is a good thing. It's a bit of a sledgehammer, but maybe the sledgehammer was required for this particular problem. So I think um, so. Um, I think it was very much an attitude of uh, that, you know, uh, you have asked for government assistance and direction. Here is some non-regulatory um, intervention um, uh, that is at your disposal. And that was the thing that encouraged some of the private sector uh, uh, involvement. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much for those responses. Uh, now, I've asked our two uh, panelists to uh, provide their own comment uh, out of their own perspective of on what you have said and maybe what you have not said and and to put that into maybe a swedish context so so um, i will turn over to to Anne marie first and and we will be keen to hear what your comments are on uh, the national cyber security center Anne marie over to you yes thank you well first of all i think this is really really interesting and the lessons learned is something that i like I mean, I've been working for the Swedish Internet Infrastructure Foundation for almost 20 years, and we have for a very long time been promoting the implementation of the cybersecurity baseline in all uh, somewhat important services where the common public have a problem to identify, as you say, what is fraud, what is real, and that is in DNS, in uh, web services and email. And that is standards that have been around for five years. So more some of them 10 years so i think that was a very good advice to just specify what uh, the companies and agencies need to to uh, have as uh, as uh, security measures in the uh, in the infrastructure is a very very good start because then you have a, a firmer ground to stand on uh, the other thing is make sure that um, i mean scaling up to meet the need is uh, it's a very good uh, advice as well because this should be community driven it shouldn't be that the the best is the enemy of good enough because transparency is very important for the for the private sector to to uh, appreciate this kind of service that the government can establish and uh, present is what's in it for me and i think that is something that we have been discussing for years right now and and i think there is something in the swedish i mean swedish companies they trust the government we trust our government and agencies we like them most of the time even the tax agency uh, so it, it's much, I, I should say it would be much easier to give uh, get something uh, working here with the private sector and with the uh, public private partnership uh, because we don't have this feeling of uh, alienation from the government we work very close together but again there is something that stops us from being pragmatic i mean uh, all of we have uh, you have a very uh, you you mentioned you had a site that i would really liked uh, there's all a stake for everyone but no one is in in response of it and that's exactly the situation in sweden we have so many uh, governmental agencies that have we have a scattered responsibility in so many areas that they don't know what to do and, and who to do what, uh, which is a problem right now. And currently in Sweden, several national initiatives are underway in addition to the Swedish National Cybersecurity Center. I mean, we have the, the, the Research Institute in Sweden who are establishing a cyber ranch uh, in Gista that will be used for training and test. We have the Swedish Defense Research Agency already doing this in Linköping, another city in Sweden, and in collaboration between KTH, the Royal Technology um, University, and the Swedish Armed Force, we now have the KTH Center for Cyber Defense and Information Security. Uh, so it sounds like we are, we are 
willing too much to do things, uh, which means that we are spreading out our resources on too many different organizations. Be such a small country. I mean, we are only 10 million people. We could better coordinate our resources. Uh, so that is um, what I get from your presentation. Make it collaborative and try to, to narrow the scope. I hope I interpreted you right. Thank, thank you very much, Anne-Marie, for those uh, ideas and reflections. And I will now turn to, uh, to you, Juan. And then when you, Juan, is done, I will, we will have time for one or two questions from the audience. So I will ask our <coughs> chat monitor, Mr. Klinteng, to be ready to, to provide one or two questions from the chat to Kieran. But first, you, Juan, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll try to keep this short then. Um, very interesting for a guy like me who works with threats. I uh, really appreciate that you took that up as the first thing. And I think that an important lesson for us in Sweden is that uh, intelligence or knowledge has to be actionable in order to provide effect for the system in, in, in large. And uh, very good also to have dissemination for different uh, target groups, so to say, with the public and the technical people, etc. Uh, also very interesting to hear about your uh, smart meter system and the payment uh, system thinking, uh, because I think that we ha have to have uh, criteria, thresholds, and I know I, I read your paper in the uh, King College and, and, and the Lawfare blog recently about deterrence. It's a very interesting thing, and I'd like to have you comment about that when you speak in doctrine wise, we have uh, land warfare doctrines, we have uh, uh, the, the maritime sector and, and the air force, uh, the airspace uh, war fighting doctrines. What does the cyberspace or the cyber doctrine most resemble? That is a question. And uh, one last remark, and that is uh, uh, the, the next step in structural changes on the internet. What would that be? Thank you, Yuan. So those were two, uh, I assume, uh, sufficiently complex <laughs> questions that Yuan concluded his remark with. So, Kieran, uh, a quick uh, response to those questions, please. Well, um, I first want to endorse um, in, uh, with humility uh, Anne Marie's uh, comments because, I mean, uh, I think the analysis in them was um, something I would concur with and. and Terms of my pretty superficial but um, well disposed uh, impressions of Sweden uh, sounds very really accurate. So, um, uh, uh, and your characterization of what I said was, um, um, I think, absolutely fair. And thank you. Um, in terms of um, uh, Johan's uh, two, uh, you know, pretty fundamental and substantial uh, questions. Um, so I'll answer them in reverse order. The structural changes in the internet, I think, are um, interesting and actually probably, if we get them right for the better uh, in a security point of view. So I'm always obsessed in, um, about economics and cybersecurity. Um, so uh, one of the problems, actually the biggest so source of problem we've had in the last 25 years has been through no fault of anybody, it's just the way it happened. Um, an internet economy grew up out of California where you gave away personal data for free in order to get cash free access to web based services which you know for, has all sorts of wider problems that we're beginning to realize but from a security point of view it was pretty bad um the internet economy the di digital economy is now changing there's still a lot of that but if you look at things that are with us to an extent like iot internet of things um that is as the name suggests something that implies mostly a physical product and a service with it um, so um, and for most of those IOT products you pay with money um, uh, you, you both for the product you know you buy a box for your home <clears throat> or whatever and then you um, have a service provider and all of those things mean that you can um, uh, you can actually have some more sort of trading standards if you like you know you can actually say well that you know uh, this service um, uh, either doesn't meet basic regulations so you're not allowed to sell it just any more than you can sell a defective automobile um, or you, know, you can say well this isn't great on security but it's cheaper and the consumer can make an informed choice and at the moment the consumer can't make an informed choice on se secure technology but um, I think that sort of thing is changing and we need to do that and build that into you know artificial intelligence related things into quantum um, uh, etc. Um, 
So that's the way in which the structural changes are, are happening. And I think if we get it right, also, you know, it's not too late. We only realized the cybersecurity problem with the previous generation of technology when it was already there and we were trying to retrofit security. These things are things that policymakers, you know, in partnership with the private sector can actually get get at now, which is the right time. So that's the sort of structural changes on the sort of cyber deterrence. I mean, I'm a hopeless military theorist. And um, I think what's interesting about this is that, as I said at that King's lecture that you kindly took an interest in, you know, at one end, there's sort of national security strategists and think tanks and generals and, and all of that, you know, talking about war fighting. And at the other end, you know, you and I and our families and our children and elderly parents are all worried about, you know, how secure is this and, and and it's just basic consumer technology and it's the same stuff and we're hopeless at getting those two conversations um uh we're hopeless at getting those two conversations um uh, aligned where and one of the biggest weaknesses i think is that because the two phrases and concepts of cyber in them people think they're the same thing so cyber security cyber security it's how safe is this phone that i just held up and the nuclear firing chain for you know britain's nuclear weapons and swedish power grids and and you know the data set for the um french healthcare system what whatever whatever it is that's cyber security and i think we understand that and then people say well you know if we get hit we need to hit back with cyber and then we've got this thing called offensive cyber well Here's an example to illustrate the point where I think they're just not the same thing. Um, the first and main declared, publicly declared, so I can talk about a British offensive cyber operation was against so-called Islamic State. That was in pursuit of three objectives. One was to reduce international terrorism by Islamic State by crippling their um, digital infrastructure they were using for radicalization and plotting and all the rest of it, communication. Two was to assist the military forces battling Islamic State and the Mosul offensive. And three was to reduce the risk of domestic terrorism by reducing their ability to radicalize British Muslims online. Right. So those are three laudable objectives for the use of offensive cyber in what seems to have been a very effective operation. None of those three objectives have anything to do with UK cybersecurity, because whatever threat so-called Islamic State posed, and it posed a whole range of threats to all sorts of different people in the UK and abroad, it had, was not a cyber capable power. So stop cyber, the cyber domain, whatever else it is, whether it's land, sea or air, the one thing it's not, but it's often talked about as if it were, is a boxing ring where, you know, you've got an offense, you know, you're punched, sorry, to, <laughs> now you're gesticulating, you've got an offense, you can punch, and then you've got a defense and you go like this. It's not like that, you know, it's just part of life. And it's everything from military assets all the way through to my 11 year old daughter's new iPhone. And, uh, you know, so we need a whole bunch of things. And, you know, just saying that this, I'm afraid, and this is why I just think that ultimately for advanced, open, free, liberal democracies, defense of primacy matters, is that ultimately you're never gonna sort this out in some sort of secret, invisible battlefield. Um, you know, you're gonna sort this out by giving people secure products and services, in my view. Thank you very much, uh, Kieran. And uh, in, in the interest of timeliness, I will actually conclude this seminar uh, in just a few minutes. I, I see that we have had lots of, of, or at least a number of questions on the chat. Right. And I think that really makes me uh, regret the fact that this could have been a live seminar where we could have uh, continued the discussion at the mingle once the official presentation was over. And let's hope that we can get back there uh, sooner rather than later. So again, Kieran, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I certainly took a number of things home, uh, among them the phrase, of, uh, as Anna alluded to, that everybody has a stake but nobody's in charge. And how difficult can it be to avoid such a situation in Sweden is a question that we might ponder on uh, after this seminar. And I think it was also interesting to hear that the first thing you said was was don't focus too much on the center. It's actually more about policy and what you do and how you do it rather than how you organize government. Uh, and again, that is um, something that we, we will follow that closely, those of us who will, will oh, um, be curious about what the Swedish center will be soon. So again, thank you very much. And before we conclude, I will be uh, happy to give you the floor one last time, Kieran. Well, actually, thank you um, uh, for listening. Sorry, I could talk about this all day, and I'm sorry we can't have a drink and a chat afterwards. Um, the one thing I should have said, you know, and you rightly, when you're summarizing, saying don't focus too much on the organization, um, technical expertise within the organization really matters. You know, um, this isn't something you can bluff. 
and you know I was not an expert in cybersecurity. Um, I, I think you need a mixture of technical expertise and digital translators because you're not asking government leaders, business leaders to become cybersecurity experts. Well, and if you are, <laughs> it's not going to work. Um, but you know you do need um, some people who really know what they're talking about. And good luck. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you me. very much. And, and to our listeners, uh, I would like to say for those who came in late or for those who realize you would want your friends and colleagues to hear what has been said today, in due course, this uh, seminar will be uh, published on the uh, AppSea Stockholm chapter website. And you can always follow the AppSea Stockholm chapter on Facebook. Then you will be updated on when we publish things. And uh, do not hesitate to uh, also join FCS Stockholm chapter as a member and you will have access to even more information. Again, thank you so much and let's all be cyber secure out there and have a good evening. Thank you.